Okay, you guys, we're going to go ahead and get started since um, we only have the hour, or now about 45 minutes. Um, so my name is Nadia Alami. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm a first-year pediatric nurse practitioner practitioner student in the School of Nursing, um, and we're really excited for today's talk. It's an issue that has been coming up, um, and the idea of the talk came about by a group of nursing students, um, because as nursing students, we know that our food environment impacts health outcomes. We just actually had a full lecture about it, um, but we don't support the healthiest food environment for ourselves, and nor do we ensure that healthcare students and staff have resources to eat healthy. Um, so this event is aimed to address that. Uh, I want to thank Ellie Fox Cheney, if she's here, Carly Waterstrout, Haley Davis, and Eva Petrovich for inspiring the event and helping coordinate. Um, I'd also like to thank the following sponsors who helped make it possible, the Graduate Professional School Association and UCSF Wellness for providing lunch, um, ASSN, Student Life, and the Philip Arley Institute for Health Policy Studies um, for their support. So we have two great speakers today, and we also have a financial aid rep here to talk a little bit about how to enroll in CalFresh. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Laura Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt is a professor of health policy in the School of Medicine at UCSF. She is the lead investigator of Sugar Science, a groundbreaking research and education initiative designed to highlight the most authoritative scientific findings on added sugar and its impact on health. So please join me in welcoming Professor Schmidt. Is there, is there a clicker? Okay, no problem. So uh, there is such a thing as free lunch. Thank you. School of nursing. It's great. And it's also healthy. So uh, hopefully we'll be seeing more of that on our campuses. Um, so thanks a lot for being here and enjoy your lunch. I'm happy to be uh, the entertainment while you chew and view. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I have no conflicts of interest, and this is a big issue in my line of work because uh, I have been the target of uh, harassment in various uh, 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 campaigns, uh, probably uh, largely launched by the soda in, in food industries to uh, make me stop doing what I do for a living. And it's, um, I'm always very careful to uh, share with audiences that I don't take any money from the food or beverage industries or anyone with a, with a financial stake in the kind of research and work I do for a living. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly talk a little bit about the scope of the food problem, and I particularly focus on sugar uh, for now. Uh, we're, we'll, as we uh, drive down sugar consumption and related diseases in the United States, we need to move towards the whole processed food environment that we're in. Sugar is low-hanging fruit, so that's where we start. I'm going to talk about some of the underlying causes of the epidemic in chronic disease, uh, some solutions and some barriers to reform, and I'm trying to make this real quick because we got off to a late start. Oh, okay. You guys, can you hear me in back? Yeah, I have such a loud one. Oh, they're recording. Sorry. Now I'm going to have to speak quietly. <laughs> okay, and, and stand by the podium. Uh, so um, I talk about, I do a lot of work uh, internationally. And when I go to uh, developing countries, what I see are populations uh, is suffering from extreme uh, food deprivation, nutritional deprivation, obesity, and primarily uh, diabetes and other forms of chronic disease. And let me give you an example. Mexico, highest rates of diabetes in the world, highest rates of soda consumption in the world. The Mexican government is in a situation right now where they have an entire generation of people who have had uncontrolled diabetes. They are now um, uh, stuck with damaged kidneys there are not enough kidneys to go around to transplant, and so they have an entire population of people on dialysis. And their healthcare system is going to be crippled by the cost of maintaining this population on this very high, um, um, uh, highly costly form of care, right? So this is what countries around the world are dealing with thanks to the Western diet and the food corporations that are really the vector of a pandemic of chronic disease all over the world. As our consumption of soda is going down, we're down 25% uh, from our peak in the late 90s, guess where they go to sell their stuff? They go overseas. So when we talk about this food problem we've got, we need to think about it very much in the frame of global warming. 
it's a situation that's very hard to make the scientific case at, er, this early on that we have a global crisis. But we have the warning signs, just like the polar bears on the, on the icebergs and the big chunks of ice that are melting in the Arctic. We have warning signs that are showing us that we have a global pandemic on our hands. And unless we get our food supply back into shape, we are in serious trouble globally. And there are two trends that tell us, just like global warming, a, a, a three degree rise in the Earth's temperature that tell us that we have a crisis on our hands, a global crisis. And the first is the rising rates of adult d diseases in children. So this is our, uh, the U.S. diabetes uh, rates starting in 1958 and ending in, in 2010, CDC data. Okay, this is not something you see <laughs> occurring. Many of these cases are children. This is not something you see occurring unless something has changed in the environment. You don't see big changes in the prevalence of, a, of an adult disease appearing in children unless you have a change in the food environment. And, and that's what, the, what, what statistics like this point us to. It's not like suddenly the whole U.S. population lost their willpower, right? Uh, in addition to the rising rates of chronic disease in children, we have whole new disease categories that we didn't even have before. So how many here are familiar with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? About half of you, right? So this is a condition, we didn't even have a name for it until 1980. Our obesity um, epidemic and spike in carbohydrate consumption started around the early 70s. By 1980s, we start seeing this new disease on, on the horizon, NAFLD. It's now about a third of the U.S. adult population, about 13% of our kids have it. It's going to be the leading cause of liver transplantation in America in five years. There are two dietary risk factors for this disease. Trans fat consumption, fructose consumption. The liver, as many of you know as health professionals, is a very critical organ in our bodies. The, when, when our liver, liver gets clogged up with fat, it produces a cascade of hormonal and adverse effects that lead to insulin resistance and ultimately uh, chronic disease outcomes. So this is the global warming of public health. In, in sum, you don't see changes like this, diseases of adulthood in children, new conditions arising, all related to a particular food ingredient without something happening in the environment. All of these changes track to rising, spiking uh, rates of carbohydrate consumption and particularly sugar consumption, not just in the U.S., and, but globally. So the issue here is that it's about our environment. We know for, we have uh, mountains and mountains of evidence that show that diets and exercise on their own don't work. And it's just like my teenager. I say, don't use drugs, sweetheart, right? And then I send her out into, a, into, a, into parties where everybody's smoking pot. What am I gonna do? Can I expect her to, you know, not go with the pack? If she's in a drug-saturated environment, she's gonna do what everyone else is doing, right? If I send her to an environment that, is, that I say, don't use drugs, sweetheart, and I send her to an environment that isn't saturated with drugs, she's likely to follow my advice, right? And this is what we know from the food, from the mountains of evidence, from diets work temporarily, they don't deal with the long-term chronic disease outcomes that are related to obesity. Once you've got diabetes, you got it for life. So they're, they're not the solution. Uh, our, food is, our food supply, the way I like to think about it, as, as a person with an addiction background, is in terms of this concept of saturated environments. And we all know one when we see one. Like the tenderloin is an alcohol and drug saturated environment. You go into this corner store, and what you'll see is 40 ounce malt liquor uh, beverages, very high octane alcohol, sold for $1.87. That's called an alcohol saturated environment. And we know that people who live in these environments drink a lot. It's, it shouldn't be a surprise, right? It's the same with our food environment. If I've got a 48 ounce Gatorade, doesn't matter if it's organic Gatorade, that's their latest trick. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm gonna, you know, if it, it's all over my environment, I'm thirsty, I'm in the gym, sure, I'll drink that, especially if it kind of prods me, oh, it's organic, that makes it okay, right? So it makes, we have to change our food environment in order to fix this problem. So there are some very simple solutions at work. We know the food industry 
has mountains of science, scientific studies. They are working 24-7 in their labs and their marketing teams and their focus groups to figure out ways to make their products more attractive to us, whether it's putting caffeine in with the sugar so that we have multiple substances that are habit forming, whether it's dosing it, whether it's putting, making the marketing very selective to a particular population, they, they're working overtime to rig our food environment to make us sick. So what we have to do is turn that around and re-rig the environment to make us healthy. And it's not that complicated. There's one, one rule of, one. I call it the iron rule of, of the law of public health. And we know this works with alcohol, tobacco, all different forms of unhealthy products that are being marketed to populations. And it's a simple rule, and any solution to this problem follows this rule. And it goes like this. If you reduce the availability of something in the environment that is harmful to people, and it can be addictive, it could be alcohol, tobacco, junk food, it will reduce their con the population consumption. And in doing so, you reduce the harm to health. So it all comes down to reducing the availability of these products and ideally making some of this healthy stuff really easily within reach. So you make the healthy product the, 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 the easy thing to get. Just to play devil's advocate, um, it's my choice. Yes. It is absolutely your choice. And do you want Coca-Cola to be making choices for you? Do you want to live in, a, in an environment that is dominated by large food corporations that are unregulated and that are stacking your environment against health? I would like to have a choice between a Coke and a bottle of water. And the, thing, the problem with the Coke is it's addictive, right? And it's, and it's, and, and it's selectively marketed. Nobody's, nobody's putting uh, flashing lights and fancy marketing around those water stations in the halls, right? In fact, I used to have to go into a bathroom to fill up my water bottle for years. I'm grateful to have them, right? But it's a combination of careful marketing and engineering of foods to make them absolutely irresistible, and especially to children. They want to hook people at the youngest age possible because they know that's when brand loyalty gets started and then saturating the environment with it so that you don't have alternatives. And we know from a lot of experimental evidence in public health trials that if you put the apple next to the, the, the Doritos, people are gonna go for the Doritos, right? Those things taste like cardboard without the fat, sugar, and salt added, right? But with those three carefully, uh, 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 those ingredients carefully uh, titrated into that recipe to make your, your, your taste buds and your limbic region go, wow, it's going to be very hard to say no and choose the apple. The apple has, has, it has a lot less marketing. There, there, I don't know a lot of multinational corporations that spend, uh, you know, the Apple Institute, right? Uh, why do we focus on sugary drinks? Right now, it's the low-hanging fruit in our food environment. And it, 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 these are products with no nutritional value. Uh, they are the largest single source of added sugar. So if we can get people to reduce their consumption of this, that's a good place to start. It gets people down. So you can have added a hidden sugar. People obsess about hidden sugar in all of their, you know, different foods. If you can just stop drinking the, these beverages, you're already dramatically uh, rigging your, yourself for health. Uh, they're not satiating, and they come with no, no uh, fats, so they get absorbed very quickly. They slam your pancreas and liver with a very heavy do doses of fructose and glucose and uh, therefore uh, lead to insulin resistance and ultimately diabetes and chronic disease. So the most effective strategies are all things that follow the iron uh, law. We reduce the availability. We make it a little harder to get. That's fiscal strategies like taxation, raise the price. We uh, uh, taxation works because it raises the price, but it also works because it's really easy for governments to do this. And they actually like to do it. I've been working with the South African government uh, that it just passed a tax. Uh, and, you know, it comes out of the Department of Treasury. It's easy for governments to do. It's easy for them to levy the tax. It's something they can do to change the food environment that's quick and easy. And often they can put the proceeds to people in the, uh, to programs that will um, uh, create healthy options like clean water and other, op uh, other oppor 
opportunities. Uh, evidence shows, uh, we used to think that, well, if you're an alcoholic, a tax isn't actually going to affect you because you're addicted. Actually, that's not true. We now know that the heaviest consumers are actually different, disproportionately affected by taxes. So it's a really good thing, even for people at the extreme ends. Um, and I'm going to just skip quickly because I want to I want to be able to uh, give Ruben some time. A second option is controls at the point of sale. So this is something that hasn't been done much, but the idea here is to, uh, for example, uh, governments worked really hard to get soda out of public schools. So guess what happens? Pop up all around the school district and the schools, corner stores selling peddling junk to kids on their way to and from school, right? It's pretty inevitable. So what you do is you get your, light, your zoning commission to say, hey, during certain hours, you can't sell junk to kids, right? You can't capitalize off the fact that the public schools now no longer have their Coke contracts, right? And so these are things we, that you can put, cobble together, different public health strategies that really start to shape the environment in ways that protect kids. Um, another, another great strategy that has been um, actually, uh, we are the front the, the leaders in this area is institu institutional sales bans. So while the soda companies can sue the city of San Francisco, as they currently are, for passing a law to put a warning label on advertisements for soda, right? And they can certainly go after t anybody who's trying to advocate for taxes. What they can't do is come after private employers who don't want to, who want to get out of the business of making profits off of junk food. And so there's something called the Equal Protection Clause. And so far, um, I don't think Trump has gotten into the Constitution yet. But in the Constitution, we have something called the Equal Protection Clause that actually allows people, institutions, to sell what they want. And so as a health sciences campus, our leadership, uh, spearheaded by uh, folks in our wellness uh, division, said, hey, why should we be selling this stuff? This uh, chief medical officer of, our, of, our, of UCSF Health said, we don't put tobacco in our vending machines. We know this stuff is bad for people. Why would we be selling it? And so they stopped. They just got out of the business. It's not about changing choice because you can bring it in. You can go off campus and buy it. It's just the idea is that we, why, why should we, as an institution that stands for health, be in the business of making money off of products that our own scientists and doctors tell us and nurses tell us are bad for us, right? So it's a simple thing. We have been tracking employees at UCSF for a year now and looking at changes. We've even taken blood samples from a, a, a group of, of um, our employees and tracked with changes in their metabolic health. And what we've seen is especially in our lowest um, income populations of workers, our service manual workers, our shuttle drivers, our hardworking janitors, folks who are most at risk for uh, overconsumption of sugary beverages and chronic disease, we've seen a 25% decline in their consumption of sugary beverages. So that is just by one little institutional policy. And these, uh, you know, these are folks that at the beginning of, uh, before the sales, uh, the um, the Healthy Beverage Initiative, we're consuming almost a liter of, so of soda a day. And we've seen them decline by 25%. We've seen changes in their, in, their, in their weight and in their waist circumference. Pretty darn good. Can't complain about that. Another thing is counter-advertising campaigns. This is one from the uh, New York City. that is that he, uh, they, they, they use the very uh, kind of the happy, uh, you know, soda ad uh, uh, spirit to make this case. And so they're kind of turning, turning that, that storyline around. So counter advertising campaigns are a really great part of any uh, broad public health movement to get people uh, to wake up to products that, are, that look uh, attractive because producers make them attractive, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, or junk food. They make it look attractive. They even uh, make advertisements that make you think, oh, it's Coke green. It must be environmentally good, 
right? That's their latest thing. It's organic Gatorade. That must mean it's good for me, right? And they, 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 these kinds of advertisements are designed to kind of flip that script and to say, uh-uh, look, turn the can around and look what's in it, right? Okay, I am going to very quickly, I think just to give a little more, maybe close down now, I can talk very briefly about what, I mean, I've got like five minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, do you, what do you? Yeah, I think maybe a couple more minutes and then we'll take Okay. I just want to talk to a, a little bit about, um, you know, this has been a really hard war uh, that we've been fighting here to uh, go up against such a powerful um, industry and well, deep, with deep pockets. It's not unlike what has what ha happened in, in uh, the 20th century around tobacco, which is, according to the CDC, one of the top ten public health victories of the 20th century. <laughs> so a, a century where we were getting ba flu vaccines to populations, right, and things like that. And the, the, when you look at, the, at what we were able to do in terms of turning around the, the lung cancer epidemic, it's just stunning. And it was done through a lot of serious pressure politically, through the scientific community, through the advocacy community, and through citizens' actions to reframe tobacco as a product that we, is not healthy. Just because everyone does it does not mean it's healthy, and really get people to, to think differently about this, uh, fighting against politicians who are being paid by industry to vote up and down. I've sat, given testimony to many, many uh, Senate and, and uh, legislative bodies where people won't look me in the eyes because Pepsi paid them the night before to not vote in favor of what I'm advocating for as a public health strategy. Uh, literally, these people will not look you in the eyes because they feel guilty. And, and so we're, we're up against an, uh, uh, an industry that is a very powerful player, and it's, it takes a lot of hands in the pot to make change happen. Um, this is just an example. Soda taxes, we've just now recently in the last uh, few years gotten movement on this issue. Uh, typically, when, when it comes to taxing unhealthy products, America's the last to come along because we usually are the producers of the products, <laughs> whether it be tobacco, junk food. And so because of that, uh, our governments tend to be pretty locked down in terms of political campaign donations and so forth. And uh, while we do have transparency and we know that our politicians are taking large sums of money from food corporations, uh, we really can't do anything about it. Uh, they can take, uh, except to just point out the fact that this is what's, what goes on. So for many, many years, there were numerous uh, uh, tilting at windmills, senators at the state and federal levels constantly putting up soda tax. Uh, and it, it, these things would get shot down. Still in California, you know, Senator Bloom can't even get um, uh, a soda tax bill out of the health committee in the assembly. Uh, and, and, but what happened was, Advocates decided to shift to the local level, and then what happened was a little bit of the leveling of the playing field because large philanthropists started to come in and back these coalitions on the ground, namely the Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Laura and John Arnold Foundations have backed the, not anything like the money that the companies spend in these battles, but definitely helping to bankroll the folks on the ground who are fighting and trying to get the word out the, these, the industry's lying to you, it's not a grocery tax. It's a tax on soda, right? And so that message, and so that's, the, and, and also we've got scientists now, the science has come around fatty liver disease, diabetes, and heart disease has come together in a way that it's really hard for anyone looking at the evidence to say, uh-uh, those products aren't, you know, a, a risk factor in these uh, disease outcomes. And so we've got scientists who are able to make the case to policymakers and, and suggest evidence-based policies. So it's all come together and we've started to see a real shift. What's really cool is what's going on at the global level, which is uh, tremendous momentum. We've got uh, Country, you know, uh, many countries in the Nordic region, most of our island nations in the Americas 
uh, where we've got massive obesity epidemics, have passed soda taxes. We've now got our first one in the African continent. Uh, India's uh, poised, they've got one that's gotten out of one chamber in the house, a 40% tax on sodas. So we're seeing uh, many, many lawmakers around the world are looking at the cost, the rising cost of diabetes in particular, and saying, uh-uh, we can't do this. They've seen what went down in Mexico, and they don't want to be, be there. Uh, uh, this is this really interesting diagram. This is actually, it came in the DC Leaks uh, documents. And it's the Coca-Cola European strategy uh, likely to materialize. These are th regulations that they might have to deal with. And then business impact. And soda taxes are right up there in the top corner. And so that's why they've doubled down the way they have. And they're spending, you know, what was it, $26 million just in the Bay Area to fight the last round of taxes. Ridiculous amounts of money because they do not want the finger to come out of the dike. Fortunately, it already has. Um, and then, of course, uh, you may be aware of uh, the work by Kristen Kearns here, a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Dentistry, who has studied the sugar industry using internal documents. And uh, we, she's been uh, demonstrating in a very vivid way how industry meddles in the actual re uh, scientific enterprise. Uh, last uh, winter paper came out in JAMA Internal Medicine showing that the Sugar Association, the trade organization for the sugar producers, bought out scientists at Harvard who published a review saying, hey, we don't need to worry about sugar. We need to worry about fat and, and cholesterol and heart disease in the 60s. And we got, what did we get? A lot of sugar consumption and obesity epidemic. So we know we, we actually have an active program here at UCSF where we're, we're very much like what we do with the tobacco documents uh, we're studying industry and how it in interferes with science and um, the scientific process. And there's uh, quite a, a, a lot of active work going on right now in this area. So summing up, lots of uh, uh, concerns around a global, unsustainable rise in the rates of obesity-related conditions. You don't have to be obese or overweight to have chronic metabolic disease. And that's a really important thing for all of us to remember. Uh, you, uh, it, uh, it's, these are diseases driven by poor diet. And often food insecurity and chronic metabolic disease and poor diet go together. And Ruben's going to talk a little bit about that. We need to deal with these political barriers to, um, to, to uh, cleaning up our food environment. And that really is what we have to do, clean up our food environment. And the tide, fortunately, is starting to turn. It's still a heavy lift. And any of you that are excited um, uh, to get involved in the work going on here at UCSF in this area, um, on our own campuses, cleaning up our own food environment and being a, a model for other institutions and in how to do that, or even in the research area, you know, you know how to find me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. And I just want to put a quick plug for Laura Ishkenia brought um, from the wellness department a healthy meetings guide. So this is one way to get involved. It kind of talks about how to provide healthy meetings for staff, students, anything. So we'll have copies of these going around. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Ruben Canedo, who serves as co-chair um, of the University of California Basic Needs Committee. Um, he coordinates the efforts of campus food security working groups at all 10 campuses and is engaged actively researching and addressing college stu student food access and security. So please join me in welcoming Ruben. Awesome. All righty. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, that was amazing. Uh, so um, my goal today is to just give you a very, very uh, brief overview of the work that we got going on around basic needs across the UC system. There's a lot of efforts that are starting to develop at UCSF's campus. Full transparency, this is a campus that I'm very, very, very focused on. Barbara, one of your co-chairs and chair of the campus committee on basic needs is here with us. Uh, she was handing out subs, sandwiches. What did you all get today? Yeah, all the good stuff. So you already met your, your, your campus committee chair. Um, graduate and professional school students aren't being visibilized the way that we should be visibilizing them and you all. So that's why I wanted to be here in person. So um, the conversation uh, starts from here. 
Food insecurity and homelessness isn't a UC only problem, isn't a state problem, isn't a national problem. It's a global challenge that we are experiencing. And I'm very happy to be in the health medical space because I don't even have to break down too much stuff. You know, hunger, uh, malnourishment, homelessness are not coming languages as we're finding out. So food insecurity, uh, we're using the USDA definition, which is the impact on quality of food and quantity of food. And those are very, very important for us to help people understand because as we break things down, people start realizing that, oh, you know what? I actually do come from a food insecurity background. When I think about the food that was accessible to us, that, I, that we consumed either by choice or by circumstance, I might have not been hungry, but I was malnourished. So doing that education is very important uh, for us. As I shared with you all, there's, uh, there's a, it's a national challenge. The darker the green, the larger the, the hunger rate and malnourishment rate. The state of California has about 5.4 million people that are considered food insecure. By that definition, it's about 13.9% of our state. When you look at homelessness, homelessness is something that folks debate a lot on the definition. Should it be two weeks? Should it be three weeks? Should it be one week? But by the end of the day, this is what our federal description is at the moment. We have no idea what's going to happen with that moving forward because of the current state of federal affairs. But it describes a person who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Many of you here that are linguists that are very intentional about what does that actually mean and how do we do a statistical analysis of what an adequate household is, I feel you. I don't have time to break that down. Just trust me. Shit is real. So uh, total, people, total people experiencing homelessness on a given night. I love this. This is web accessible to you all. This presentation is going to be made accessible to y'all. You can always look up how many people went homeless that night per population counts. So you see that the state of California actually has a substantial amount. One in four people that are homeless in the United States are in the state of California. Most people don't know that. We don't talk about that when we talk about California. Um, we also have California-specific statistics. Let me draw your attention to the, at the bottom, the unaccompanied young adults ages 18 to 24. That's when we talk about folks that were former foster youth, folks that are undocumented and unaccounted for, so on and so forth. That's in that conversation. Moving on, what about college students specifically? Two weeks ago, we published the latest national study. Uh, the, public, the study was led by the Wisconsin Hope Lab, Sarah Goldrig Rabb. She was also the keynote for South by Southwest. If you're interested in South by Southwest keynotes, you look at uh, Sarah Goldrig Rabb. It was a sample of 33,000 students from all across the country. They found a food insecurity rate of 66%. That compares to 14% of households, to give you a, for, a frame of reference. Ho uh, housing insecurity, meaning you're spending even a more than 40% of your monthly income on housing alone, which everybody in San Francisco is very welcomed in that conversation, right? Um, that's housing insecurity as opposed to homelessness. Homelessness is the most extreme aspect of housing insecurity. That means you have nowhere to go for two weeks to call your own. Many of us in the Bay Area also happen to be living in situations where our names are not in the contract. So on a best case scenario, landlord comes in and says, you know what, I'm keeping the folks on the contract, everybody else gotta go. In a worst case scenario, everybody gotta go and everybody gets written up for the renter server. So then the next time that you try to look for housing, you're gonna have that flag there. The spectrum of how folks are reacting is very vast. Right now, one of the most conservative areas is San Diego. San Diego just passed a law to do the latter. That if you're found in a tenancy where somebody comes in and you're not on the contract, you're going to be marked off in your renter's file. What is a renter's file? Nobody knows. Apparently, they're going to make one. So um, the last thing that I want to showcase here is working and on financial aid. There is a lot of shame. There's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of misinformation, and there's a lot of ignorance in this conversation, assuming that people are not doing their part to secure themselves. So what we have here is that about a third of those, uh, of those students that were found to be either homeless or food insecure actually were working and were also receiving financial aid, meaning that they met the minimum requirements to be full-time college students. Did y'all follow that? I know I'm going a little bit fast or just mom speed. Uh, the last thing that I want to highlight here in orange is there's very little difference in geographic region. When you look at the data from all across the country, across these 24 states, there's a consistency in that metrics that you're seeing up here. 
is a substantial challenge, no matter if you're in California, or you look at the sample of Texas, or you look at the sample of New York, or you look at the sample in the Midwest, this consistency in this level, which is what prompted us to be able to effectively negotiate for Senator Elizabeth Warren and five other senators to now trigger a government accountability office study that's gonna focus on basic needs on college students. So now let's bring it to, to uh, oh, I know some of you are very fancy with your data. I just wanna show there's some real stuff in there, okay? This is not just made up some of the points. You can look at that, it's free. Um, the second uh, study that was national that actually included more than community college students that provided four-year students also found a 48% food insecurity rate. So that's just the number that we're going with. It's anywhere between 40 to, what was the last one? I'm sorry, 66, damn, okay, that's big. So we're moving forward now. UC system specific data, this is the first time in the history of the literature that we actually have a graduate student population participating to identify what is graduate student slash professional school student food insecurity. The largest sample, UCSF. So you all are the ones that are setting the pace for this conversation. Now we know that in the state of California, 48% of undergraduates were food insecure and 25% of graduate slash professional school students are food insecure. So when we talk about students, and when you hear me say we're doing this for students, we're talking about undergraduates and graduate slash professional. I know what that is. I remember my graduate school days when I, I was invited to meetings and when people would say student, I never felt that I was being named or visibilized in that conversation. And I always had to speak up as a graduate student, right? Now we're being very intentional of not doing that. We wanna make sure that all of the studies that you see, you're gonna be able to see the brackets for undergraduate data and for graduate data. Again, this is available online. If you Google UC Food Access Study, is the first thing that's gonna pop up and you'll be able to see all your data in that conversation. If you're interested in UCSF specific data, all you have to do is send a message to Barbara or go have a conversation with Barbara. She can give you some of that data as well. The next thing that I wanted to do in terms of this study, it's very important for me to showcase this. Over half of the students that, I, that were identified as food insecure did not grow up food insecure. Is that clear for everybody? So when we have this conversation that the students that are food insecure are the lowest income students, we have to check that assumption and we have to question it, where is it coming from? I just got back from a statewide tour. We visited all 10 of the UC campuses. All 10 campuses have either a food pantry or an emergency food relief program. Every single campus that is providing a service of emergency relief, over 50% of the users are not Pell Grant recipients are not from the lowest income backgrounds. So that is also showcasing in the people that we're serving. Is that clear for folks? I know that gets a little bit confusing at times. Beautiful, y'all are brilliant. Okay, so uh, student stories. We're making sure that we're not just doing the quantitative conversation, we're doing the qualitative one. Student stories are at the forefront of all these conversations. Students consistently say, I wasn't prepared for this aspect of college. Nobody talked to me about what college was going to be like outside of the classroom. People told me about my college requirements. People told me about my graduate school requirements, about my essays. Somebody drilled me about my interviews to go to medical school, to go to, to pharmacy school, whatever. But nobody ever told me about the cost of living. Nobody told me to look at how much does it pay, how much does it cost to pay for rent? Where is the food? Where can I find the most nutritious food at the lowest cost? That kind of living hustle, that cost of living hustle, we don't talk about. And I'm gonna show it to you right here because I know you don't believe me. Stand, raise your hand, or otherwise signify if you went to a K through 12 school district that it was mandated that every single student that graduated had to be graduating with financial wellness skills, cooking skills, nutrition skills, and living skills. Stand up or otherwise signify. How many folks here are from California? How many folks here are not from California? How many folks stood up? One, yeah? Nobody? Told you, you're welcome. Okay, so another thing that we're noticing is that there's a national movement right now of opening up food pantries. And that's something that we wanna celebrate. 
Food pantries are very romantic. They're very grassroots. They're very politically incentivized. It makes you feel good to be able to serve somebody directly. But also, food pantries are not going to eradicate food insecurity or homelessness from the college experience. So because of that, we're starting a much more systemic and holistic approach. We started this two summers ago, and I'm going to close up. There's two more slides. Uh, we established a food security committee first. All 10 campuses have a committee. We submitted a proposal to the UC Office of the President, specifically the President, for us to say, if we had one year of funding, this is what we needed, this is what we need, and this is what we're going to do with it. So we were able to get that. What you see in the bottom, 15, 16, that was last academic year. Last academic year, with that funding of $75,000 per campus, we started emergency services at all 10 of the UC campuses. We were able to onboard staff for different areas. We were able to onboard student staff in different areas. We updated our data mechanisms across the UC system. The undergraduate data mechanism is called UQs, Undergraduate Experience Survey. That now includes basic needs questions. We have, for the first time, the graduate well-being survey for the UC system. That also included basic needs questions and also the cost of attendance survey. You're going to be the first group that I say this aloud to, so I'm excited about this and also very sad about this. We updated the cost of attendance survey for undergraduates. We're going to get your data coming up next. Actually, UCSF already did your survey, so I'm excited for those results. When we updated the cost of attendance survey, and instead of asking students, what are your food needs for a month, we switched that over to what are your food needs for a week, and in that shift, the data went up by 60%, six zero. And that was data that had been unchanged when you adjust by, for inflation over the last 18 years of that study. So that shows us that when we say, no, 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 we've always given students enough money, they're doing something wrong, that may be true for some, but it's not true for the majority when we've been awarding them funding that was 60% off that food cost. And that's a lot of compassion that needs to be said because we actually in the UC system have some of the largest champions in financial aid. Our financial aid leadership across the UC system are like the revolutionaries across the country. They're the ones that are always getting audited. I just got to know that Berkeley has gotten audited the last two years in a row. I don't know how many audits UCSF goes by, but they're on us. The federal government is on the UC system because they want to make sure that we're not doing anything out of the ordinary because of how innovative and intentional we are of providing as much as possible to students, which I know is very hard to hear because on the receiving end, you're like, damn, bro, why don't you give me more money? And I know that that's real. I felt that way and I had a full ride scholarship as an undergraduate and a graduate student. But when you understand the systems at play, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, an example is we operate as a system. So, for example, at the undergraduate level, UC Berkeley has a huge revenue that comes from return to aid, and UC Berkeley's is zero dollars of that. We send that money to UC Merced, we send that money to UC Irvine, because they have a much larger amount of Pell Grant lowest income students. Do we follow there, the relationship there? So that's something that I wanted to show you. Since we started doing this work, we provided services to over 52,000 visits. That can mean CalFresh, that can mean food pantries, that can mean a lecture, that can mean a teaching session, whatever that may be. We've started a new partnership with the community colleges and the CSUs because if food insecurity and homelessness are at that rate in the UC, you can only imagine what that looks like for the community colleges and the CSU systems in California. Lastly, we've traveled all across the country to make sure that we're not reproducing the wheel and to make sure that we're speaking with people that are at the leading edge of this conversation. So what does it look like to solve this? And this is where I close. You see there a family, a village. We have folks from all 10 of the campuses coming together. So how are we going to solve this? How are we going to move to a better future? It has four areas. Research. There's a huge gap in the literature. I don't know how many researchers are here, but if you're interested in finding a topic that needs you desperately, start looking at basic needs for college students in whatever context. Behavior, psychology, medicine, I don't care what you look into it, there's uh, the odds of you finding something in your specific field for college students and basic needs is very minimal. The gap is humongous. Uh, second is our institutional preventative models. We cannot just embrace food pantries and think that if you have a food pantry, people become food secure. It doesn't work that way. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. 
Third is structural engagement. There's a lot of structural systems level contracts and policies that directly impact basic needs, and we're in that conversation. And lastly is advocacy. We don't just want to publish for the sake of publishing. We don't want to just open pantries and not get better at them. And we don't want to be disenfranchised from the conversations that are happening in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. So advocacy is a huge component. Those are the four areas of our basic needs approach. That preventative model, before you even get to the UC system, we need to be updating our pamphlets, our presentations, our trainings, the hundreds of thousands of undergraduate prospective students and graduate prospective students all across the world that come to the UC system, all across the country and all across our state, need to be educated on basic needs. I'm going to ask you all this, and feel free not to answer, and feel free to look at me like that was such a rude question to even ask me because you're making me feel terrible. If somebody would have told you how expensive it was to live in San Francisco, to eat in San Francisco, your transportation in San Francisco, and the cost of living in San Francisco, would you still have come to UCSF? I'm not going to answer that for you. That's for you and your pillow tonight. So the second thing is the first year experience. By the end of the first year, every single student needs to know where the basic needs resources are. In the same way that everybody finds out where financial aid offices are or where your graduate advisor or your dean or your chair's office is, we also need to know everybody knows that easily where the basic needs support is. Every single campus is designing right now a basic needs website, basicneeds.ucsf.edu or whatever that is, where we're centralizing all those services into one single platform. Third is CalFresh. Uh, sorry, admissions messaging. I, I skipped that. That's the second one. Admissions messaging is when you get in, we're going to put those basic needs services at the forefront. Now let's go to CalFresh. State of California passed AB 1930. If, you have, if you're work study eligible, or if you hit the income bracket as a graduate professional school student, you automatically qualify for CalFresh. So we're bringing CalFresh clinics to campus and registering folks for CalFresh. That provides up to $184 on average for an individual and then an adjust by dependent count. So we're going to do that at a very high rate. We also just partnered with Code for America. If you have a smartphone right now, if you go to the Apple Store or to the Android Store and you look up Get CalFresh, it's a mobile application that takes 15 minutes and you start your process to get registered for CalFresh. Uh, th uh, third from the bottom, basic needs skills. Just like I asked you all how many of you were taught about this, we're finding out that a lot of folks need some help, need some financial strategies, cooking strategies, food prepping strategies, so on and so forth. So let's start teaching that at scale. I don't know if you know this, but some of the most popular courses across the UC are actually in nutrition. There's a course at UC Berkeley, as an example, it's called Nutritional Science 20. Over 60% of undergraduates take that class at some point. Whether they take the whole thing, that's another conversation, but they're in there. The second to last, emergency relief, that's where food pantries and stuff like that comes up. And the last thing is crisis resolution. Emergency is going to happen. Life is going to happen. We need to be ready for those things uh, for students to support them. Anything else, feel free to follow up with me, and I'm happy to offer you any data to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, so I realize that we're almost done. I want to introduce Lily Ling, who is um, our financial aid rep. Um, but before, I want to just put a plug in for Grub Market. It's an online produce vendor. They have very competitive prices, and they deliver to your store. They just applied to get CalFresh acceptance so that they can actually sell to and deliver to food stamps recipients. So sign up outside. They have a great group by program, and they're giving 20% off to students and staff. Hi, good afternoon. Okay, um, I know we're running out of time, so I just want to briefly mention two uh, programs uh, that you can participate in. First of all, it, there's a CalFresh program, and secondly, the UCSF emergency law. Before I hit on that, though, I do want to remind everybody about the food security program here at UCSF that Ruben talked so eloquently about. You can apply for the food security program at UCSF. Basically, it's a 70 bucks. Uh, every time that you apply for it, it's $50 for a Safeway gift card and $20 that you can use in uh, in one of the food vendors at UCSF Parnassus or in Mission Bay. You can go to the financial aid office website, which is finaid, F-I-N-A-I-D dot UCSF dot E-D-U, or come to inquire about it in our uh, website under the quick links. You could just click on food access, and there you go. You have that information. And once you uh, complete a form, you could pick up the gift cards either in Parnassus 
Manassas or Mission Bay, okay? So about CalFresh, I just want to briefly mention that program is a government-funded food assistance program, and uh, you can be eligible for up to about $195, uh, $194 a month for it. In a national level, CalFresh is also known as a SNAP, just in case if you might be interested, which is to call the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This $194 can be used in any food market, or I should say many food market and, and stores.